Ken's already invited me back to do one of these on Super Bowl Sunday, so I hope we can make it out. <laughs> um, a little bit about me. Uh, he talked about my career, but as a child, I grew up in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, it's on an island with about 80,000 people. Very small city, founded in 1636. Very, very uh, uh, narrow streets, old buildings. Um, things were very close together. My house there, where I grew up, is shown in the, the star in the center. Almost everything I needed as a child was within a quarter mile walk or bike of my house. We had my little league field up there, my school, playground, store where my grandmother used to send me to get cigarettes. <laughs> she gave me a note and said, please allow my grandson to buy these for me. Um, so I grew up seeing transportation from a pedestrian cyclist uh, my mother took the bus to work every day, um, got rides home. We didn't have a car. We didn't have access to a car when I was growing up. So I kind of experienced the world from the beginning from a different perspective than a lot of people. This is the biggest street in the entire city of Newport. It's four lanes, uh, divided, very pedestrian friendly. This was created through urban renewal. It used to be a one lane, uh, one way street. So I didn't have a lot of barriers. I was free to roam all over the city, ride my bike, walk, um, hang out with my friends. You know, my mother didn't have to worry about me in traffic, uh, going to the store, going to school. Um, I went to college in Boston. I worked as a limo driver uh, while I was in college at the city. Um, I actually advocated for more investment in automobile infrastructure when I was in college, believe it or not. Um, I felt the city of Boston was underserving motorists and ignoring, you know, traffic circulation, focusing too much on pedestrian uh, issues. At the time, Boston wasn't making a lot of investments in bicycle infrastructure. Then I moved uh, into the transportation sector, and I moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, which was a very fast-growing uh, beach community in coastal North Carolina, struggling with economic development in its downtown core, and then also dealing with the impacts of growth that it had seen in uh, the early 1990s, uh, 2000s, after Interstate 40 opened. So I learned a lot there about how transportation works. I dealt a lot with North Carolina DOT, uh, the AASHTO Design Guide, um, which is called the Green Book, the Highway Design Manual. I learned how decisions were being made about how roads were designed, why I saw streets without crosswalks and streets without pedestrian signals and why we were still building streets with no bike lanes uh, through the middle of a downtown uh, uh, city core. So I kind of cut my teeth there and then I moved to the city of Atlanta where I managed the transportation planning division for the city. Um, that was exciting. I worked on the Atlanta streetcar project, uh, implemented a lot of bicycle projects and really worked for, enjoyed working for another city that was highly focused on economic development and it was using transportation to generate that economic development. I'm going to talk a little bit more about more some projects in both of those cities uh, in a little bit. In January, I decided to move into the private sector and focus specifically on active transportation. Um, Alta Planning and Design is one of the premier firms in the United States that is focused specifically on bicycle and pedestrian transportation, uh, aka active transportation. We do planning design, uh, implementation, we do uh, engineering for trails, bikeways, sidewalks, pedestrian safety. Um, I do manage the group that looks at the economic impacts of making bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure investments. So I've been in the Sacramento office since January, uh, working on quite a few projects in the Bay Area right now, really enjoying the transition. So now I'm going to go back in time a little bit and talk about how the United States, streets in the United States have evolved over time. Um, this is 1930s Detroit, completely chaotic. There's no place for pedestrians, there's no place for streetcars, there's no place for, everybody is sharing the same space. There's no pavement markings, uh, no traffic signals, everybody's just moving about, you know, paying attention to each other, yielding as they need to yield, uh, and everything worked you know, generally well, until the automobile became more and more popular and advocacy groups from motorist advocacy groups started talking about uh, the dangers of pedestrian interaction, 
uh, the dangers of interacting with transit and cyclists, and motorists wanted their own space. So we started to talk about channelizing pedestrians, putting them in their own, you know, their own above grade uh, bridges and overpasses, giving the street over to automobiles. And then we started to think about creating pedestrian malls. So why don't we take the cars out of the shopping streets and give the main streets over to pedestrians? That evolved even further to where we started to separate pedestrians in our downtowns and we created entire networks of skywalks and tunnels. You see this in Houston, uh, Montreal, Minneapolis, uh, a lot of cities where you can actually explore the entire downtown whatever, without ever setting foot on a city street. What this does is it creates highways through the middle of our downtowns designed to highway standards. Uh, very little on-street parking, very little retail frontage, not a lot of pedestrian activity. Uh, these are not appealing places uh, for pedestrians. They work extremely well for automobile circulation in most cases, but it's not a place you want to visit. It's not a place you want to hang out every day. This is Washington Street in Los Angeles. We started to see trees and buildings and community amenities as hazards, fixed hazards along the roadway. This is the same street with a beautiful line of palm trees that were removed because they were a fixed hazard. They were too close to the travel lane when the road was channelized. They used to call striping lineage channelization. A complete street is easy to build if you have all the right of way in the world. This is a perfect complete street here. We have enough lanes for motor vehicles. We have a nice dedicated cycle track. We have a sidewalk. We even have a BRT light rail line in the middle street trees, a beautiful, beautiful city street. Unfortunately, in a lot of communities like San Mateo and the city where I grew up, you don't have the room for this. So a complete street is really a balancing act. You can't make everybody happy. There's no street in the world that's gonna make cyclists, pedestrians, transit users, and motorists 100% happy, except maybe this street. And even pedestrians would think this was too wide, probably, and a little bit uncomfortable to cross. But the point being, it's all a balancing act, and when you're retrofitting urban streets and trying to make them complete streets, something has to give. The motorist has to give a little. The people parking their cars have to give a little. The pedestrians may not get the full 10-foot sidewalk they're looking for. Maybe they only get 8 feet. Uh, it's all a compromise, and part of building complete streets is finding where that balance is and trying to reach that sweet spot where everybody's 60% happy, maybe. So we used to just think about speed, mobility, and safety when we are designing streets. We thought about motor vehicle level of service. We thought about fixed hazards along the side of the road. You can't put an oak tree there because somebody could run off the road and hit it, even though it provides wonderful shade when you're out walking and biking. Uh, we thought about mobility, but we thought about mobility uh, a lot from the perspective of the motorist. So a lot of the modeling we used to do back in Atlanta when we would model the transportation network, <coughs> the standard trip length they would model was 45 minutes. So they assumed that everybody traveled 45 minutes to work. And that is kind of how they designed, that's how they modeled the transportation network. All of their measurements were directly related to that 45 minute trip. So instead of, their goal was not to reduce the amount of travel people were doing, it was to make it easier for people to travel longer distances within that 45 minutes. Now we've started to think a lot differently. You know, the California legislature just passed a law that changes uh, the way CEQA deals with this. Uh, previously, uh, CEQA looked at the level of service. So if you were building a bike lane and you were taking out a travel lane or you were adding a building that had 300 resident, 300 dwellings next to a Caltrain station. CEQA used to look at what the motor vehicle impacts, the impacts of the level of service would be to the roads around that 300 unit building. The new law that was just passed is changing that paradigm completely and instead it's going to look more favorably upon that 300 unit building because it's next to a Caltrain station. In all likelihood, it's gonna reduce the amount of travel people are gonna do by automobile because they have access to Caltrain 
So we've really started to change our thinking, and this is nationally, not just in California. We're thinking more about multimodalism. An important change that's happened in the last couple of years is tying uh, health care and health impacts to transportation. Uh, we just recently started to think about the negative health impacts that it has on us to drive everywhere and to not walk, you know, not even walk to the store anymore. There's people that um, in their daily life, the only walking they do is from the parking lot to their office and then maybe from their garage in their house into the living room or the kitchen. I mean, that's pretty sad and we've really started to talk about that publicly and link the, you know, our transportation system to our healthcare costs and the impacts that it's having on our health nationally. Um, environmental quality and equity. Um, equity is about serving people that are traditionally underserved. So a lot of people don't have a choice. A car is expensive. Um, it's hard to maintain. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But equity is something that we really need to think about when we talk about complete streets. And particularly access to businesses and access to services. Um, everybody deserves to be able to reach a grocery store, a library, a school, a playground, a park. There are certain amenities that should be accessible whether or not I have an automobile uh, available in my house. So one of the big things that's led to all this change is, this is California specific. In California, the number of vehicle miles traveled, these are counters that are installed on uh, Caltrans highways since 1972. It shows the billions of miles of vehicle miles traveled per year uh, on California highways. It's been dropping continuously since 2006, uh, prior to the recession. If you look at the numbers nationally, people have been driving less since 2004, consistently, and it's a much steeper decline nationally. So that's four years before the recession. So you can't use the economy as the excuse and say that once the economy improves, people are gonna start driving again, so we need to make sure our roads are big enough. Because even before the economy, uh, the Great Recession, the uh, vehicle miles traveled started to, to decline dramatically. Um, London has started to create what are called slow zones, and they're reducing the speed limit to 20 miles an hour in residential neighborhoods. New York City next week is gonna reduce its citywide speed limit to 25 miles an hour, unless otherwise posted, and that's citywide across the entire five boroughs of New York City. Um, the city of Boston reduced its speed limit to 25 miles an hour when I lived there from 30. And the reason being, if you're hit at 30, you have an 80% chance of survival. If you're hit at 40, only uh, 1 in 10 people survive a car crash if you're hit going 40, with a car going 40 miles an hour. And this is for cyclists and pedestrians. So <coughs> no matter how well designed a roadway is, you still have to have that, you know, you're going to have accurate crossings, you're going to have pedestrians in the street. Um, on residential streets, you may not have sidewalks, you may have people interacting in kind of a shared condition. Um, and that's why cities are starting to look at reducing speeds actually even below 25 down to 20 miles an hour. This is kind of a big misperception when you talk to people about complete streets and why we should be building bike lanes. A lot of people say, well, my car taxes, my, you know, my registration fees, my car sales tax, that pays for the roads, my gas tax. Why should, I, why should my gas tax pay to build bike lanes and bus stops and sidewalks? The reality is only 50% of the cost of roadways is borne by uh, car-specific taxes. The rest of it comes from sales tax, income tax, property taxes. Um, if you think about all the emergency response that we have to pay, to, pay for for all the car crashes that occur, that all comes out of the general fund generally, the public safety uh, costs from police and fire. Owning a car is expensive. Um, I think it's estimated about $10,000 a year for somebody to drive a car. That's a lot of money, especially when you're talking about the poverty line is down around $10,000. So an average family that's below the poverty line can't afford a car. They can't get to the grocery store. If we don't have complete streets, we don't have pedestrian and bicycle and transit amenities, we're essentially holding them captive. When you choose to invest in complete streets, you're gonna see results. Um, cities all over the country are actually battling each other. Uh, the mayor of Chicago and the mayor of Seattle 
are having in uh, a media battle over who can build bike lanes the fastest, who can build protected bike lanes. Um, New York City, Washington DC, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, small cities, large cities, all across the United States are recognizing that this is something that uh, is important to their economy, important to their health, important to their city finances, and staying viable as a city. Uh, there's two really seminal studies that have been done um, regarding complete streets. Um, this is an infographic that Alta put together for the Denver Moves program in Denver. 62% um, of people that moved to Portland, Oregon, said that they moved there partly because of the bikeways that Portland has invested in. So Portland is attracting people to the city just because it is the premier, large, you know, the large bikeable city uh, that's held up as a national example. Survey in San Francisco, two out of three business owners along a corridor that had recently seen bicycle lanes installed said that they really supported the bike lanes and that they've noticed an improvement in their business uh, climate. Generally across the board when these studies are done, um, one of the key findings that's been really interesting is that cyclists actually spend more money than motorists. And I can say this from personal experience, I used to ride my bike to uh, back and forth to work in Atlanta and there was a small little kind of environmentally friendly store that had a lot of recycled gifts and you know gift cards and rugs and kitchen things and if I was driving I never would have stopped at that store I would have driven by a million times but without fail if my wife's birthday was the next week I was riding my bike by I would look in the window see something interesting they had a bike rack right in front it would take me five minutes to lock my bike up run in grab a gift jump back on my bike and ride off it's a lot easier to patronize businesses when you're walking and biking than it is to have to find a parking space, lock your car, walk to the door, go in, go back, you know, repeat and return. Um, I shop there a lot more often than I would have. I probably went in there once a month and spent money. And if I was driving, I don't think I would have made the same decision. And they found that study after study that, uh, and a Portland study actually quantified it, that cyclists spend more money uh, over a time period, but they don't, um, they don't buy as many things at once. They kind of stagger it out a little bit more. So New York uh, released a report called Measuring the Street in 2012, and they looked at projects that the New York City DOT had completed across all five boroughs, and consistently they found that when they made investments in pedestrian and bicycle space uh, along streets, most often space that was formally allocated to underutilized parking or uh, travel lanes. They saw an increase in retail sales, decrease in vacancies, and just a general improvement uh, along the blocks where these investments were made versus blocks where these investments were not made. So New York City doesn't necessarily translate directly to San Mateo, but they use an apples and apples comparison. They looked at neighborhoods where they did not make investment in New York City, and they looked at neighborhoods where they did make the investment. And there was a dramatic difference uh, in the vitality of the retail and the level of vacancies in the corridors. And these are some of the changes they made. This is Union Square in New York. A lot of underutilized pavement. They went in and created a brand new pedestrian plaza, kind of cleaned up the desire lines, made it easier to walk through the intersection. Uh, they were able to add artwork, vegetation, some seating areas. And this is all very low cost, kind of immediate change. Um, they also have done a lot of parklet installation. And uh, this particular instance, they found a 14% increase in sales at businesses that fronted this parklet. Um, and this is where they took a former parallel parking space and created a nice seating area for folks that are going to the coffee shop or getting an ice cream. And then this is a plaza in Philadelphia that was kind of underutilized, you know, concrete island. And they were reliving it up with, uh, you know, some very inexpensive planters, some, uh, you know, some outdoor seating, as well as some interesting use of some logs.
All right, so now I'm going to go, instead of just overloading you with numbers, I want to talk about some actual projects that I've worked on that were driven by the business community in the three cities that I've worked in uh, to date. So back in Wilmington, North Carolina, this is North Front Street. Uh, this was taken, I think, in 1985, somewhere around there. Um, this used to be a thriving retail street, uh, their downtown main primary downtown street that parallels the Cape Fear River. Um, it's in a grid, there's several other parallel streets, um, but this was their primary retail corridor up until the city saw uh, major white flight and disinvestment in the, uh, the 70s. So this is taken during the day on a weekday. There's one car parked out there. Um, this was a former pedestrian mall. I showed you the example of Kalamazoo a little bit earlier. Cities during the 60s and 70s, cities all over the country experimented with pedestrian malls, closing down their main street, creating you know uh, uh, entirely pedestrian areas. Most of them failed. There are a couple examples, uh, Santa Monica, um, Miami Beach. Um, downtown Crossing in Boston is somewhat successful. But generally, cities have phased those out because they just don't um, provide the access to businesses that you need to, to have a successful business district. So Wilmington, I think, in the early 80s went back and they, they ripped out the pedestrian mall and they basically converted this to a one-way street with angled parking along one side and it still didn't quite do the trick. This is uh, right about when I moved there, 2006. Um, you can see the parking's a little more filled up. It's still the one-way street, which made it really difficult if you wanted to access a business. You would have to drive around the block several times. Um, and if you came from the wrong direction, you couldn't, couldn't quite find your way there. We got a lot of complaints from tourists and visitors. They couldn't navigate the street. Um, no bicycle amenities. Uh, the pedestrian amenities were very inadequate. Um, not a lot of wayfinding signage. Uh, mostly kind of marginal businesses and restaurants were the only thing that you'd see out there during this time period. And then at night it was completely dead, aside for a couple nightclubs uh, that were down closer towards Market Street. So the city passed a bond in 2006, transportation bond, and one of the projects on the bond was to do a streetscape project, a complete street, streetscape project along two blocks of Front Street. Uh, the goal was to convert it to two-way operation, widen the sidewalks, add bicycle parking, wayfinding signage, uh, make it more pedestrian friendly, um, uh, add new meters. They, they went to single, uh, to multi-space meters, which were much more modern. You could pay by phone. So it was a complete upgrade of the entire corridor. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, this is during a weekday. Uh, on the weekends, the sidewalks are completely packed. Uh, one of the interesting things about this project is there are two traffic signals. Uh, one at Princess Street and one at Chestnut Street. And in order to replace those traffic signals, it would have added an additional $500,000 to the cost of the project. And we made the argument that first, the traffic signals weren't needed. Second of all, it would be much more pedestrian friendly without the traffic signals uh, if we went to an all-way stop where every car has to stop. And when you reach the intersection as a pedestrian at an all-way stop, you always have the right-of-way. And that was kind of counterintuitive to people. They thought they'd be safer and more comfortable crossing in a traffic signal. But once we put in the, the always stops, it really moderated the traffic speed along the corridor because people weren't speeding up when they saw a green light ahead of them. They knew they had to stop anyway, so they were much more likely to just you know go nice moderate speed through the corridor. Noise levels went down dramatically. Um, we had to do an educational video to teach people how to cross at, a one, at an always stop, which was interesting. Um, but once they got the hang of it, it worked really well. We saved the city $500,000, um, which was actually put into other amenities along the corridor. Um, very successful project. All right, so now moving to Georgia. This is uh, Pont City Market. This is a two million square foot brick building. It's the largest brick building in the southeastern United States. Uh, it's a former Sears warehouse. So they used to distribute all the Sears merchandise for the Southeast uh, through here. There was a big railroad shed right here where they would actually ship all the stuff out via railroad um, to the entire Southeast. When I moved to Atlanta, it was owned by the city of Atlanta. It was called City Hall East. 
and there were a couple little city offices down here. Everything else was completely abandoned. Uh, it was boarded up. There was flooding occurring regularly. It was down in a, a gulch, uh, kind of at the uh, very bottom of a gulch, uh, right in the center of the city. So when I moved there, the city was in negotiations with Jamestown Properties, which Jamestown Properties is a German holding company that actually built Chelsea Market in New York, which is highly successful um, mix of you know market space. Uh, tech companies are there and lofts. There's some condos, I believe. And it's directly adjacent to the High Line, which is a really uh, a national trend-setting example of a reuse of a railroad corridor. It's called the High Line. <laughs> Uh, this is the context for Pond, Pond City Market. So we have Ponce de Leon Avenue, North Avenue, Pond City Market is here, and then this green line here is what's called the Atlanta Beltline East Side Trail. And the Atlanta Beltline is a former rail corridor that circles the entire city of Atlanta. It's about 22 miles long, and it's being redeveloped as a bicycle and pedestrian path, uh, as well as a streetcar corridor. When Jamestown Properties acquired the, uh, the building for $17 million from the city, they had two major issues. The first was the flooding that I mentioned earlier. And the second was they wanted to market this development to young people, to millennials, to tech companies. They wanted to tie the building into the Atlanta Beltline, but they also wanted Ponce, which is its front door, to be a complete street. Right now it's seven lanes. Uh, High-speed traffic, 45 miles an hour. Uh, the sidewalks were in horrendous condition. So immediately upon the purchase, this is the Beltline Corridor here. Um, this is the shed that I was talking about earlier, the rail shed at Pond City Market. Um, immediately upon purchase, we worked with Pond City Market and Jamestown Properties to apply for what's called a transportation Community Systems Preservation Grant for about $700,000. And Pond City Market actually put up the local match. The city didn't have any money for the local match, but they were so interested in this project that they ponied up the local match of 20%. And the project was to connect the Atlanta Beltline into the building and also down to Pond de Leon Avenue using elevators and ramps so that we would have a seamless connection between the building and the bike trail and the bike trail and the street network. That was the first success we had with Pond City Market. Um, next, they, asked, they offered to contribute a million dollars that they would have had to spend on streetscape improvements under the city code. And instead of building streetscape improvements, they would give us the money, give us the money, and we would apply for a Livable Centers Initiative grant through our MPO. And Livable Centers Initiative was a grant program by the Atlanta Regional Commission, specifically meant to create walkable, bikeable communities. And this was, this was within an LCI area, so we were eligible. So that year, we got the largest grant award of the entire cycle. We got $5 million on top of their $1 million dollars to do uh, streetscape and complete street improvements along Ponce de Leon Avenue in front of Ponce City Market. So we were able to leverage a $1 million in private funding into six million dollars total to make improvements along the corridor, and everybody's happy. They can then market it as this great bike-friendly development. And we were able to transform Ponce de Leon Avenue from a seven-lane cross-section with no bike lanes, really inadequate sidewalks, into the beginnings of a complete street. So this is phase one of the project, where we removed two travel lanes and we added buffered bike lanes that go all the way into Midtown, which is about a mile and a half uh, to the west there. And that's one of the central business districts for the city of Atlanta. And this is taken from the Atlanta Beltline. So in the future, there will actually be elevators and ramps that bring you down to these bike lanes uh, from the Atlanta Beltline. Phase two of the project will reconstruct the sidewalks, um, add pedestrian scale lighting, uh, we're going to add hawk signals, which are mid-block crosswalks uh, that are actuated by pedestrians. That will enable people to cross uh, mid-block between uh, intersections. So I mentioned the flooding earlier. Um, this is called Historic Fourth Ward Park. That's Pond City Market over in the background there. 
This area you're looking at used to be a gigantic asphalt parking lot. And when it would rain, all of the water would just run down into this gully and funnel into Pond City Market and flood the entire first floor of the building. The city was going to build um, basically a gigantic holding tank for the stormwater uh, for upwards of $500 million, I think is what it was going to cost, $250 million. The neighborhood got together and said, instead of building a huge underground holding tank, why don't you build us a park that also doubles as a retention pond? So the city actually got agreed to do it. Pond City Market was on board because it would deal with the flooding and also create this amazing amenity for the community. So what came out of it is historic Fourth Ward Park. All of this area that you see down here, when it rains, the water actually comes up to about here. Uh, almost up to the railing uh, where we're at, and it becomes a gigantic pond uh, retention area. All the vegetation can survive uh, flooding and drying out. Um, it's an amazing community amenity now. It has attracted, I think, 2,000 housing units within the last five years have been constructed around this entire, it's a beautiful scene when you look at it. There's all these modern buildings around this uh, amazing stone kind of retention pond park. And then Pond City Market's kind of the keystone. And um, I was part of a recruitment effort for Athena Health, which uh, Athena Health is a Boston-based company. They do software to help doctors and insurance companies interact with each other. A very successful business. They had offices in suburban Atlanta in a town called Alpharetta. And they were trying to attract young folks to work at the company. And None of the young folks wanted to live out in Alpharetta. It's 20, 30 miles north of downtown Atlanta. Um, very poor transit service, not a lot of nightlife, not a lot of bike head infrastructure for you know, recreation on the weekends. So Pond City Market tried to woo Athena Health to relocate their offices from Alpharetta to Pond City Market. And one of the first questions that the Athena Health people asked was, What's going on with Ponce de Leon Avenue? Are you going to put some bike lanes on there? We need people, you know, we, that road's horrendous. And luckily, we already had the grant lined up. Um, they elected to take their economic benefit money that they got from the state and actually put it into a shuttle service that will bring people to the MARTA station, which is the heavy rail system uh, for Atlanta. And that was, and they were, that was the first land that Ponce City Market got. Everybody was really excited. Um, they're now in the building. And the remainder of Pond City Market opens up at the end of this year. Um, the streetscape project, I think, kicks off next month. And then the ramp project will follow shortly after that. But very transformative project. So the last project I want to talk about is Morgan Hill, California. This is a project I'm working on now. Um, we just had a huge event last weekend. Uh, it was kind of the, the um, capstone for the entire project. This is Monterey Road. It's a uh, former US 101 um, prior to the freeway being constructed. This was the, the main highway uh, connecting Morgan Hill to the rest of California. It's a four lane roadway divided with about a 20 foot median, uh, two lanes plus a parking lane on either side. Since the 1990s possibly, the business community in Morgan Hill has been asking for a road diet. They wanted to reduce the number of travel lanes through downtown in order to make it more livable, more walkable, quieter, um, moderate speeds, uh, make it easier for people to cross the street. And they were just getting no traction at all. Um, it's in the city's uh, specific plan for downtown. Uh, it's been in plan after plan, and they just were not able to get a lot of traction uh, move, to move it forward. And then recently, I think it was maybe last year, the city finally completed a new bypass called Butterfield Boulevard, which is a parallel street, uh, just maybe half a mile to the east of Monterey Road. And it's a six lane road, divided, uh, very, you know, very well designed, designed for regional bypass traffic. So then the business community started to get, you know, a little more amped up. They're like, we have a bypass now. Let's revisit this. Can we please look at reducing through traffic on Monterey Road? And they hired Alta Planning and Design to kind of develop a strategy to implement this road diet. 
And I started working with them back in August. And first we developed a purpose and need, you know, why are we doing this project? We identified noise as a huge issue. I went out there with a decibel meter and actually took noise readings. And the readings were as high as a jackhammer at 50 feet at some uh, points during Friday rush hour. Um, crossing the street was very uncomfortable, especially children, families with children didn't feel comfortable letting their children walk freely where they could dart out into the street because of the vehicle speeds. Um, there were no bicycle amenities, so there was nowhere for anybody to ride a bike. Uh, they were having a lot of sidewalk riding issues. Um, and they just generally felt that they wanted to go to the next level. Um, downtown Morgan Hill is adorable. The first time I saw it, I was impressed. Restaurants, shops, really good selection. But they're just not happy. They want to go to that next level. They want more economic development. They want to develop the vacant parcels that they have. Um, they want to get more stable businesses in there that you know get away from some of the more marginal stuff and build some really good anchor uh, establishments. So we came up with a couple alternatives for them. This is the all pedestrian space alternative. And then this is the buffered bike lane alternative. And we actually came up with four alternatives, but these are the two that we decided to move forward with. And then last Friday, we did what's called a tactical urbanism demonstration, where we actually closed off two of the travel lanes right before rush hour on Friday. Oh, <laughs> and <laughs> this is me out here putting down traffic tape to create the buffered bike lane alternative. We did the buffered bike lane on one side, and then we did the all pedestrian space on the other side using wine barrels, some AstroTurf, uh, you know, some leftover benches. And we got this up at uh, three o'clock on Friday. We did some monitoring during rush hour on Friday to see how it works. Um, we set up input boards where we talked to the community, got feedback, we got a lot of video and photos. And overall, very successful event. We left it up all day Saturday and then we took it down on Sunday morning. Uh, this is the buffered bike lane alternative. We actually put in some physical protection uh, to try to simulate what a protected bike lane would look like. And then we built a really neat boardwalk that actually bypasses a sidewalk cafe. And that enables the restaurant to actually use the entire sidewalk area for seating because we created a new pedestrian area that they could bypass. Basically expanding the pedestrian area by about 10 feet. So the next step for this project is we're going to go back to the city council in Morgan Hill. We're going to report back on our findings from this. And then they're doing something really smart that I wish all cities that wanted to do road diets would do. They're going to do a six month pilot. So they're going to take the recommendation that we come up with and they're going to put it out there for six months and they're going to test it throughout the six month period. They're going to look at sales tax receipts, to see if business goes up or down. They're going to look at parking occupancy to see if parking is being more or less utilized. Um, traffic flow, cut through, neighbor, cut through traffic through uh, neighborhoods and side streets, whole host of evaluation criteria. And then at the end of the six months, they're going to decide whether or not they want to keep it. Based not on anecdotal evidence or who cries the loudest, they're actually going to look at the evaluation criteria and see whether it's been a positive or negative thing for downtown and for the city. And I think that's amazing. I haven't worked with a lot of communities who are that deliberative about this type of thing. And I'm excited to see it. So if you only remember four things from my presentation tonight, um, this was hard. I wanted to list 100 things. But streets have only recently been designed for cars. They're places first. So before cars existed, streets were your front door. They were your front yard. They were, you know, community places, parades, gathering, talking, hanging out with your neighbors. Um, cars weren't always around. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of places in the United States that are easy to drive to. We've done a really good job designing an automobile-oriented nation over the last 50 years. There's very few places that are walkable and bikeable, and San Mateo is one of those places. So I think places that are in this position need to really take it to the next level and exploit that if they want to attract business and you know residents and uh, investment into their community complete streets can be tested they can be modified and if they don't work they can be removed 
It's not the end of the world. It's pavement markings, usually signage, striping, very, you know, very few of them involve any major civil work that can't be reversed. So you're not locking yourself into something for 50 years. If that chart I showed you earlier, if traffic starts to increase five years down the road, we can always go back and revisit you know, the changes that we've made during this downturn if it turns out to just be a temporary downturn in uh, vehicle miles traveled. And then the most successful projects, and this is especially pertinent to this discussion tonight, um, in my experience are partnerships between the public and private sector. Um, when I started in Atlanta, the city was almost holding back the progress that the residents and the business owners were asking for. I would go to community meetings and I would hear people demanding bike lanes, demanding more sidewalks and pedestrian crossings. And I'd come from a place where I was kind of serving as the advocate. So it was really interesting to be on the other side and be in a place where I felt like the city was holding the, the community back from doing what it really wanted to do. And that's one of the things we were able to change when I was in Atlanta, is we started to partner with the businesses and the communities and really start to move projects forward. And I think that's essential. And that's my presentation, and we need to check in on the game, I think, <laughs> before we go to Q&A. <laughs>